time of preaching and teaching. If you haven't invited someone into our service today, go ahead, take a few moments and do that on our Facebook Live page and invite folks to join us for this uh, sermon. Uh, we are always after our Easter uh, Resurrection Sunday, move into a little bit of a, a season of just answering and trying to answer the question, what does it mean to live in a post-resurrection reality? And knowing and believing that for many of us, uh, the Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, is not only a high point in our Christian worship, but for many of us personally, Resurrection and Easter is also another opportunity for us to recommit ourselves anew to living our lives in light of Jesus' resurrection. And so we're going to take a few moments this week and uh, over the next couple of weeks, we'll have a, actually have a couple guest speakers coming in for the next few weeks to, to kind of come and, and open up the word of God and share a little bit uh, around some of these topics for us. Uh, but we're going to be talking a little bit about this post-resurrection reality. So John chapter number, I believe 20, is uh, where we'll go. Uh, the sermon title today will be No More Locks. No More Locks. Turn with me, then, if you don't mind, to uh, John chapter 20, verse 19. It is on the screen as well, and we'll get a chance to read a little bit what the Word of the Lord says about No More Locks. Verse number 19, when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Now, it's important to set the context. Jesus, of course, had just been killed a few days later. Last week, we talked about how he was resurrected, and all the folks showed up, and, you know, Jesus got up so you can get out. So they all, like, you know, supposedly out now and, and liberated and free. And then the first day of the week, so later on in that week, just one week later, they back locked themselves up in the room. Uh, so that's something deep, right? One week after their, one of the most greatest experiences of their lives, they are back locked up in a room for fear of the Jews. But Jesus came, stood among them, and said, peace with you. Verse 20, after Jesus said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Everybody say go. go. And when Jesus had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, of any they are retained. That's deep. Verse 24 but Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told Thomas, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. How many of y'all like that, right? I got to see it to believe it. Amen. It's all right. Amen. Because uh, Jesus you know, he, he, he do his plans with you in mind. Let's keep reading. Verse 26. A week later, the disciples were again in the house. Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then Jesus said to Thomas, put your fingers here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Verse 29, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So again, we're preaching on the topic, no more locks. Bow your heads with us as we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you and please send your anointing 
that makes teaching and preaching easy, let it rest upon me and even all those who are hearing. In Jesus' name we pray. Let us all say amen. All right. Pat yourself on the chest and say, I need to lose my locks. I need to lose my locks. I need to lose my locks. Not your locks, but, you know, the other locks. Isn't it interesting, uh, and if we be honest, this may be true for many of us, that after a extraordinary encounter, after a huge success, Human nature is often, you know, kind of predisposed to have a letdown. You know, you can be on a mountain high. You can have experienced this amazing, you know, like in, in sports, uh, you know, they call it the post-championship funk, right? Like you can win a championship and then the next year in many, uh, particularly in football, most folks who go to the Super Bowl don't make it back the next year because they hit this lull. They have experienced something that is so amazing and so transformative, and then all of a sudden, the immediate response is not to ride that momentum into something that is even more greater. The often default is to fall into a funk to start to retreat or to lose focus of that which you just encountered or experienced. And there's a lot of reasons why I think we are often predisposed to falling into a post-experience funk, if you will. Some of these things that we experience in our lives are often at a direct contradiction to the great experience that we just achieved or went through that put us on a high note, on a high pedestal, if you will. And then you realize, man, it's hard to stay up here in the clouds. Especially when I got weights on my feet dragging me back down to reality. Anybody ever been there before? Anybody ever been there? It's like, woo, I just had, man, woo. This was just amazing. It was amazing. And then all of a sudden, you go back home and you're like, yep, I still live in the same apartment. <laughs> or, or, you know, you went to this great conference and, and you met all these people. You were networking. Then you show back up into your office and you look across your cubicle. You're like, mm, mm, mm. Can I go back to the conference, amen? Or you come to church on Easter Sunday and you hear all these great messages about how God's going to turn everything around and how, the, you know, uh, Jesus was in the grave on a, on a Friday and a Saturday and he got up so you can get out. And you was like, whoa, I'm out. <laughs> then Monday came and you was back in the sunken place. Amen. It was like, man, that, that, was, a, that was a break. That wasn't no deliverance. That, that was a break. And you're left now feeling, man, why is it that I continue to have the roller coaster experience in my life? I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that the, your life will not be characterized by highs and lows and ups and downs. But I do want to suggest to you today that there are some tactics, some practices, and even some choices that we can make today that can make sure that we are not locked into a perpetual place or cycle that betrays God's original intent, which is for us to be free to worship and serve him, the creation, and those around us. I want to suggest to you that part of what living in light of resurrection does is that it opens our imagination so we don't have to continue to look at our circumstances and think that that is the final reality. Living in a post-resurrection moment allows you and I to be reminded consistently that the, the, the words that the devil had to give was absorbed by Jesus. And Jesus turned that around and made it a source 
of our hope, our salvation, and our victory. Resurrection Sunday is a big deal if you and I can be reminded that I and we and you don't have to live our lives locked in a cycle of death and hopelessness. But you and I have to be honest and be real about some of the reasons why we find ourselves locked up, locked down, locked in, and locked out. Because for all the freedom and liberation we want, a lot of us carry around just as many locks as we do that keep us less free than we can be. Because I found that if, <laughs> if Jesus came to set us free, the only thing that can keep us bound is us. I mean, because Jesus, you know, Jesus ain't like limited by Jesus' power. So there must be a little bit of something, something that you and I must need to do to be complicit with our liberation. Ooh, that's good, right? I want to be complicit with my liberation. You ought to, you ought to just, just say that. Complicit with my liberation. I don't want to be complicit with my bondage, but I want to be complicit. I want to be a partner. I want to be one of these folks when people are trying to figure out, how'd you get so free? You can be like, God did it. And I cooperated. All right. All right. <laughs> Not like God did it and drug me kicking and screaming the whole way. Had no, I mean, God will do that sometimes. Anybody ever had God just drag you like, and you was like, nah, 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 nah. I kind of do that with my daughter the other day, <laughs> dragging her to liberation. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't drag her. I don't believe, we, are, we don't believe in none of that. Freedom. So here we have in the Gospel of John, a very serious retelling of the post-resurrection reality of some folk who, listen, knew that Jesus was going to die, but still weren't prepared. Knew that he was going to rise from the dead, but didn't believe. And he showed up, and they still ended up locked up in a room. Jesus told everybody what he was going to do. And those even closest to Jesus were so overtaken by their human weakness that they couldn't stay the course. And this is why I love the gospel. Because Jesus is always giving us the ideal He's always giving us the, the end result. And Jesus is always making uh, a room for us to not get it the first time. Or the second time. Or the third. Can I hear four, five, six, seven? Right? Like someone said, how many times would Jesus give you a chance until you get it right? Now, the challenge is, you getting it right, you taking a million chances to get it right means you have to kind of go through a million circumstances to be able to, to, to benefit from what you could experience the first time. It's like, you know, she's not going to get tired of you coming to be convinced. But how many know every time you have to be convinced is usually because you in a mess. And you being in a mess is not always a pleasant experience. At least it, my messes ain't very pleasant. When I'm in a mess, I'll be like, Jesus, help me. It's more like, help me. <laughs> now, you know, that's how you know you're not really in a mess. You're like, oh, thou great Jehovah. <laughs> you who has brought me safe thus far along the way. You who have through thy mind kept me in the night. May we never, from your, our, the path we stray, whatever those words are. That ain't the kind of situation I'm talking about. I'm talking about a situation where you like, help me. Some of y'all, y'all just practice with me. You did it this week. How'd you holler? You said what? Help me. Yeah. See what I mean? 
y'all got some practice. And isn't this something that every time you holler for help, Jesus is still there to help you? But how many of you can't wait for a day where you don't have to holler for help for the same thing? <laughs> right? I want to graduate to some new, some new helps. <laughs> Lord, help me today. I'm tired of this old help stuff. This old help stuff is wearing me out. And this is what happened to the they 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 they, they listen. Now, you know, you, you, we got to be honest and real that if Jesus, you know, because we read this stuff, and I know some of us in here don't even believe this stuff. It's like, you know, I, I don't believe the supernatural part of the Bible. I just believe the prophetic and the, the justice side. But that, you know, God bless you. I'm glad you're here. Uh, but, but you know, you know, you got to give these folks some credit a little bit because it's like if you saw somebody dead on Friday and then they walking around on Sunday... <laughs> You talking about I see dead people is just like, you know, I think I gotta go to my therapist this week because I'm just, the ancestors, they like sitting up in my room. And as much as I want to be connected with the ancestors, not that close, right? So I give them a little bit of credit that, you know, they were shook. Cause, you know, if the Roman Empire kills people, they usually stay dead. Hmm? So it wasn't this small thing that they were being expected to believe this magnanimous claim. Even if they saw with their own eyes that Jesus was alive. But this is why I know this claim has more likelihood of being true than not. Is because these same folk went to their death believing this claim. Now... There are a lot of things I would die for. I would not die for a lie. Right. Right. Like, you know, because, you know, you know, when they died back then, they was like fed to, you know, lions and tigers, bears. Oh, my. They were crucified, tortured. All they had to do was say, what, you, what you're saying you saw was not true. But these folk endured all of this torture and said, I cannot change my confession. I don't know about y'all, but God's done a few things for me that ain't no hearsay. There are a few hearsay things that, you know, you know uh, I've heard and I'll be like, yeah, okay, I heard that. I don't know for sure. So if you're talking about killing me about what I heard, hmm, you know. But if you're telling me that I have to deny my own experience. Hmm. Don't you know there are folk out here right now who are willing to die based off of what they believe? Nothing can make them change their mind. I believe it's because they've crossed the threshold of fear and moved into the realm of faith. And how many of you know when you can get from faith, from fear to faith, you can conquer almost anything? Lord, help us to move from fear to faith because it is that movement that causes these locks that we're carrying to fall to the ground. There are a few ways then that I think are worthy of our, of our reflection particularly when we are in the book of John, because John, the gospel writer, is writing to some folk who are not fully convinced that Jesus is Lord, fully God, fully human. Even back then, less than 100 years after Jesus' death, there are a lot of folks who were thinking that Jesus only appeared to be human, or only appeared to be divine. So John is trying to make this argument, and all through the book of John, John will make these claims about Jesus, and he would try to use Jesus' mastery over nature, Jesus' mastery over disease, Jesus' mastery over life and death to help folks understand that Jesus was different than any other liberatory figure that's ever shown up on scene. So Jesus' whole life through the prism of John is attempting to demonstrate that Jesus is more than. <laughs> I'll just stop right there. 
Aren't you glad that Jesus is more than? And you can put in whatever you want after that. Jesus is more than your struggle. Somebody shout hallelujah. Jesus is more than your hurt. Somebody shout hallelujah. Jesus is more than your disappointment. Somebody shout hallelujah. Jesus is more than whatever it is you're going through. Jesus showed up so he can be more than. And John has a whole story, 20-something chapters worth. And I love the last verse. If I was going to preach another text, it would say, he made a believer out of me. Ooh, I feel like something's trying to get me to preach an old school black church sermon today. Mm. But, 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 but don't you know that there's enough that's happening in your life? You could have the gospel according, I don't know, to Dominique, the gospel according to Rose, the gospel according to Tyrone, <laughs> Keisha, Shanae. That God has done enough in your life that God can write a whole letter to make a believer not just out of you, but out of somebody else. That's the power of your testimony. Give your neighbor a high five. Tell him, I got a testimony. I got a testimony. That is what gives the power of the resurrected one life after death. Is that through your life, your lived life, Jesus continues across generation to help folks understand how to get past these locked places. The first thing that I think then is worthy of our consideration, many of us will find ourselves locked up. Somebody holler locked up. In verse number 19, the scripture says that the doors of the house were locked. Listen, I am convinced that there are houses, systems, structures that are designed to lock you and I up. Someone in this world is spending a lot of their time trying to plan ways to lock you and I up. And I know that in the age of mass incarceration and liberation and revolution, we are all aware of some of these systems, patriarchy, this idea that, you know, uh, force and masculinity and, and hierarchy uh, should, should oppress anyone who don't fit in those categories. I'm talking about a system. Misogyny. What else can we talk about? Toxic masculinity. War, rumors of war, yeah. capitalism, yeah. racism, militarism, systems that are constructed to lock us up. And in this month, I was just reading uh, last night or the night before, this is sexual, sexual violence awareness month or sexual abuse awareness month. Yeah. And I was just reading the statistics, heartbreaking statistics of all of the women in particular. Some are in this congregation, if the data is right, and I'm sure it is, who have had to survive, endure, be subjected to violence, sexual violence, mostly by men, even in the church. And I was just reading the, the material, and I just was, I was, I was heartbroken, you know, because I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm thankful and proud to say that I've, I, I've not abused a woman sexually in that way. And so my mind is very hard for me to imagine, fellas, what would predispose us or get us to do that to the folk that have been given to us as gifts in our lives. Because the, the data was telling me that it's not just partner violence, that much of this happens to children. I think a third of it in the article says before they are adolescent. And then perpetually happens through their lives. And I begin to weep because I got two daughters and I was just thinking, Lord, it made me want to just not let my daughters go nowhere. It's like, you staying with me. See them folk with leashes on their kids. And I'm like, I understand why now. You're going to stay with me. 
that there's an awareness that we have to have because that can be a house or a structure that locks our sisters and survivors up. And they have to spend their whole life trying to get rid of these locks. Because for some of these systems and structures, there's a reason why foes got locks. I mean, even in the story, you know, we talk and laugh about the, 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 the disciples all upset and hiding out. But there's a reason why they locked themselves in the room. Because they just killed Jesus. It's not like they locked themselves in the room because they had nothing else better to do. They're like, no, I was with Jesus on Thursday, you know, the day before they killed Jesus. And so it's like, you know, they may be looking for me too. And I take this system very seriously because the system just killed up my leader. How many know sometimes fear is a useful tool to help us realize the stakes we are in? Fear. Fear often lets you and I know that trouble is around us. Fear lets us be reminded that we are human. We're not supernatural. Fear helps us to understand that there's something that requires our immediate attention. But fear alone can paralyze you. Fear alone can keep you hiding behind locked doors. Fear alone can trigger irrational responses and behaviors. And how many know when Jesus shows up, Jesus don't show up to keep your fear intact. Jesus shows up to give us courage and peace to confront those things that have caused us to be locked up. That's the good news of resurrection. The good news isn't that you won't endure challenge. But the good news is that I don't have to be determined by this fear, by the reality of this system, of this experience, of these people, places, things. The question then I want you to think about, what systems have contributed to your lockup? What experiences have locked the doors of your heart, your mind, your soul. And what are you willing to do to get free from this lock up? Because I am convinced that the, the, the way you and I get free is to introduce the opposite of that thing which has tried to lock us up. We talk a lot about toxic masculinity. Guess what? There is such thing as healthy masculinity. And so you and I, Got to learn, fellas, how to be healthy in our masculinity. And sisters, we have to learn how to make sure that you only allow healthy masculinity right. into your life. Right. Some of us got to be held accountable, amen, because some of us, we just, you know, don't know what we're doing. Because some of us have been victimized as well. In some of my, my, my violence work across the country, we talk about we have to erase the false distinction between victim and perpetrator because often in our work of gun violence in our communities the more you talk to the young folk they themselves have been victimized first some of the young folk we work with even got bullets in their bodies right now so I told the folk you know who is the perpetrator and who is the victim? If you 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and you've been shot at so many times that now you feel like you have to go around and carry weapons to protect yourself, do using preemptive violence, you know, kind of like the United States did a couple weeks ago when we dropped that Moab bomb, preemptive violence. Hello, somebody. I'm, 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 I'm not going to go there because... I get stuck in a rut. How many of you know that when you are victimized, when you are rendered 
paralyzed and helpless from the violence that is visited upon you if you and I don't address and deal and get the courage, the Holy Ghost courage, the supernatural courage to change those parts of our lives, we will forever be locked up. And God don't need the people of God locked up. If you're in a relationship, God don't need you locked up behind a closed door when you're supposed to be sharing your life with that partner. If you're in the community, God don't need you locked up behind a closed door when you're supposed to be sharing the best part of yourself with the world. If you're in ministry, you can't be locked up when you're supposed to be an agent of light and liberation to those around you who are looking for the living God. So we got to ask ourselves, Lord, how do you help us to be free from being locked up? The second thing that I love about this particular passage is that uh, it says in verse number 20 that the doors were locked for fear of the Jews. How many of you know sometimes we are locked up and then sometimes we lock ourselves in? Now, this is very interesting to me because the reason they locked themselves in, the scripture says, was because of the fear of the Jews. Now, again, this is some, some rational thinking. These Jews, they just killed. They just used. This is deep, right? This is <laughs> some, if some, of, some of our small thinking folks today. I, I call them small thinking. They would call this black on black crime, Woo! right? Jewish leaders use the empire to kill their Jewish comrade. Intracommunal violence. Huh? How many of you know sometimes uh, the, the psalmist said it like this, if it was my enemy who had risen his hand against me, I would not have been surprised. But it was you, my brother, who actually stabbed me in the back. I didn't see it coming. How many know sometimes you can be in a relationship with folk? You think they your skin folk, your family. But they say just because they your skin folk don't mean they your kin folk. Now we got to say just because they your kin folk don't mean they your people either. How many know violation often happens the most painfully with people we are in close proximity to. Lord, this is a heavy message. I know it's a heavy message, but I'm trying to help us unlock some of these locks in our lives because we've locked ourselves in. You can be violated so many times, let down so many times, disappointed so many times that you lock yourself in. It's not that somebody locked you up. You locked yourself in. And some of us do it as a point of a defense mechanism. Yes. I ain't going to never let that happen to me again. That's human. And remember, pat yourself on the chest and say, I'm human. Come on, say that. I'm human. Just say it one more time because some of y'all don't think you're human. But just say, I'm human. <laughs> some, some of these responses, I can't even control. I wish that I was just speaking in tongues every day, just flowing. I, we, when I be giving my little, sorry, I tickle myself sometimes. But when I, when I be giving my little, uh, my little introductions, you know, when I'm out here speaking to all these folk, I say, you know, I'm a fourth generation holiness Pentecostal. And they be like, ooh, touch your neighbor. They even know to say touch your neighbor, right, when I say that. I say, you know, we speak in tongues. We swing from the shaft and the chandeliers. We holler and scream. And on a good Sunday, we even levitate. I know some of y'all waiting for that Sunday, right? <laughs> Don't you wish that you could live your whole life in that kind of spiritual euphoria? Don't you wish you could live your whole life in the immediate aftermath of seeing Jesus alive and just being overwhelmed by the greatness of this reality that death has been defeated? And because death has been defeated, all things are possible and I don't have to worry about anything. And then you realize that that distance between that high moment in your life and the low moments in your life can cause you to lock yourself in. I want you to be someone who is honest enough with yourself to know what has locked you in. 
Because it's easy to focus on the, the man outside who's locked you up. The system outside that's locked you up. The circumstances locked you up. And we all focus on them now. They're not getting no free ride at the Way Christian Center. Amen. If you racist, we coming for you. If you a warmonger, we coming for you. Hello, somebody. If you a violent, you know, death dealing, uh, uh, lying politician, we coming for you. But I also want us to come for those things. Whew. That lock us in. Because that liberation can help you be an agent of other kinds of liberation as well. How do you how do you deal with some of these things that lock you in? Well, here at the way, we've tried to offer free therapeutic sessions with counselors. So some of us who can't afford or don't see it as enough as an investment yet to spend $60, $70, $80 to go sit down and talk through some of your struggles rather than have a conversation in your head over and over and over again, over drinks, <laughs> over puff, puff, and passing, over eating and shopping. Hello, somebody. Because how many know you're going you to have a conversation now? <laughs> yeah, it ain't like that conversation is going to not be there. Oh, I know I'm locked in, but they ain't going to ever talk about it. I ain't going to ever think about it. I'm just going to be in denial. No, you're not. You'll dream about it. You'll think about it. Your life will be determined by it. So what do we do? Go get some therapy. Go sit down and talk to somebody. And I'm thankful we've been getting some of the receipts. Some of the saints are going to get some therapy. I ought to give you a high five and tell them, go get some therapy. Go get some therapy. What, how, how else do you deal with being locked in? You got to practice your spiritual disciplines. Do you pray every day more than your food blessing? Now, you know your food blessing, Jesus wept. <laughs> that, ain't, that ain't no prayer that's going to set you free. <laughs> Lord, help us. Do you spend time on your knees in the presence of God and say, Lord, I've locked myself in. Do you fast? Do you read your word? Hello, somebody. Do you worship? When you come into the house of the Lord or when you're driving in your car, can you lift up your hands and close your eyes and just imagine that you're part of the, the heavenly chorus and you're giving God some glory and some praise? Or are you just too sophisticated to do all that? And so you're going to stay locked in. I'm going to stay locked in. Because my PhD taught me that my emotions must not supersede my intellect. Because my intellect will be the... No, the devil is a lie. No, 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 no. Now, understand, I, I'm smart. I love learning. I, I mean, I love re reading and, and, and accumulating knowledge, but I know there's only some kind of touch from God that's going to lock me or unlock me out of some of this stuff that I don't lock myself in. So don't get too smart that now you got a lock called intellect that you've added to the other thousands of locks. This is not an anti-intellectual. I want you to get every degree on a thermometer. But I want you to always remember that there are spiritual disciplines that the church, God's people have been practicing before you was ever imagined in the mind of the human family that brought you into the world. And they realized that. Tell Jesus all about your problems. He'll hear your faintest cry. 
the answer by and by. Have a little talk with Jesus. Oh, Jesus wasn't real. All right, well, Jesus was real enough to get your people through that. Yeah, right now, we drowning. <laughs> Barely holding on. You, you throwing away the life raft that brought your people over? No. Don't cast away your confidence, your faith. All right, I'm, 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 I'm locked up. Fear the Jews. What are some questions? Who has caused you harm? Who are those people that have caused you harm? Where are you hiding? What practices must you engage to move past these harmful people, the anger, fear, and pain? In the story, it was Jewish leaders, their own family members, their own loved ones that betrayed Jesus and used the empire to carry out that death sentence. Who were the folk in your life? But you got to be able to check. Oh, I, all right, I'm going to forgive you. And, and we got to talk about forgiveness. We ain't going to talk about it today because my time is long gone. I've just been preaching too long. But understand that forgiveness, though hard it is, benefits you more than the person you're forgiving. So God, I pray, Lord, help me to forgive some of these folk because I know it's so much, it feels, it feels better to just, just, just be puffy. <laughs> with resentment and oh yeah man I see you I pro ooh, don't let me see you you did this to me and I'm just ooh, ooh. you know you're supposed to be the Holy Ghost but it ain't the Holy Ghost that's causing you to get it you know the saints used to call it a quickening you know you'll buy just mm, 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 mm. That, I mean, that ain't the Holy Ghost when you see that person you ain't, mm, 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 that's not the Holy Ghost <laughs> that's that other ghost right it's like oh yeah yeah that one in there too but how many know when you don't forgive those who violate, it's like you eating rat poison and hoping the rat dies. Now, forgiveness don't mean you just keep like, you know, putting yourself, okay, you missed this part of my head, so go ahead and knock it right there. Forgiveness means you remove yourself from the impending violence or injury or harm. But forgiveness means I'm not going to walk around here allowing you or that to have power over me. I'm going to let it go. 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 And you may not be able to let it go like some of these folk, you know, who be on the news after something ha terrible happens to their family. I forgive you. I'll be like, ooh, God bless you. But I need at least a week or two to just, <laughs> just gotta let this thing simmer a little while. It may take you months. It may take you years. But I declare that the child of God must be someone committed to working out forgiveness. Last thing on this, why? Because God says, if you don't forgive your brother and sister, then the Father won't forgive you. And I don't know about you, but I know the sins that I need God to forgive me of. It's like, oh, that's manipulative. Well, maybe it's just a truth of the matter that you can't be all that you need to be if you're holding on to past hurts and harms. Last thing I'll say about this, you may be locked up, you may be locked in. Last thing I'll say, locked out, but it's a different locked out. Because how many know sometimes you can lock yourself in or you can be locked up, but Jesus is never locked out. I love the passage where it says, although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them. That's how you live your life in light of a resurrected Savior is that you are convinced that no matter what doors you think you lock, yeah. Jesus can still show up in the middle of your locked places. I love this old Easter homily. I, I, I forgot to read it last week, so I'm going to read it today. It says, I did not create you to be held a prisoner in hell. Rise from the dead. Somebody say, rise from the dead. Rise from the dead, for I am the life of the dead. Rise up, work of my hands. You who were, who were created in my image, rise and let us leave this place. For you, you're, you're in me and I am in you. Together we form 
one person and we cannot be separated. Don't you know that there's some circumstances where you are locking yourself out from the help that God has brought your way? And so sometimes, because you're locking that help out, Jesus has to jump in with both feet into your circumstance to remind you that there is no locked door, there is no shut door that you can keep me out of. That Jesus says, I am the key. I am the way. I am the door. I am the life. I am the truth. And because I am that... You can't shut me out of a place I'm trying to get into. Woo, that's some good news, y'all. Because some of us have been scheming to keep God out of this situation. We've been scheming to keep help out of this situation. We've been scheming to keep healing far from us. But Jesus says it does not matter what your plans are because I want you to be well. I want you to be healed. I want you to be free. And many are the plans of the wicked. But how many of you know God delivers us from every one of them? And that's That's why I want you to know, child of God, today, that whenever you feel yourself locked up or whenever you feel yourself locked in or wherever you feel yourself locked out, you serve a risen Savior who has shown us time and time again that there is no door that God cannot God cannot open. There is no circumstance that God cannot enter. There is no disease that God cannot heal. There is no hopelessness that God can't interrupt. There is no death that God can't overcome. There is no power that God cannot defeat because I, I serve a God who is is able uh, to do exceedingly uh, and abundantly uh, above all uh, we ask or think. Uh, that God uh, is the God of all creation. Uh, that God uh, is the God of justice. Uh, that God uh, is the God of liberation. Uh, that God uh, is the God of healing. Uh, that God uh, is the God of victory. Uh, and I'm so glad uh, that I've got the victory. I'm so glad that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Shout hallelujah. No more locks. Get rid of your locks. If the lock is on the door of your heart, get rid of it. If the lock is in the prison of your mind, get rid of it. If the lock has got your soul all bound, be free today. Because whom the sun says free is free indeed. How many know God can free you even while you're in physical bondage? That's why I love all y'all, Sister Rain, all the go to the jails and the prisons. Because I've never met more free folk than some of those folk who in prison. I mean, their mind has been free. They more smart than many. They taking advantage because they realize that you may be able to jail my body, but you can't jail my mind. You can't jail my soul. You can't jail my hope. God forbid that you got to be physically incarcerated before you get free. I don't know about you today, but Resurrection Easter is here every year to remind you and I that we don't have to wait for liberation to come. Liberation's already here. These things were written, John said, so you may come to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that through your believing, you may have life in his name. Come on, stand with me and let's take a few moments.